Good day. Over the course of yesterday, I discussed in some detail the military reports that have been flooding in from the battlefields about the situation in Bakhmut, about the situation in the Svatovo Kremenaya area. I also touched on some of the reports about the fighting in Vugladar. Today, as is so often the case, the reports from the battlefronts have dwindled away. That doesn't mean that there isn't fighting going on. It doesn't mean that one side or another isn't making significant progress. It simply means that whoever is in charge of controlling the flow of information from the battlefronts has simply tightened up control again. It's a regular pattern throughout this war. We get a lot of information all at the same time. And then at other points, we have periods of apparent quiet, which often conceal lots of things going on on the actual battlefronts. Now, there have been some reports over the last couple of hours that the situation in the northern part of the battlefront around Svatovo, Kremenaya, Liman, Kupiansk has continued to intensify, that the fighting there has become more heavy and that the Russians are making progress and, according to one report in the Daily Telegraph, they might even have achieved, or at least are claiming to have achieved, some sort of breakthrough. Now, there isn't a huge amount of information about this, but we have had a report from um, an official, Vitaly Ganshev, who is the Russian-appointed administrator of the areas of Kharkov region, which the Russians control. And Ganshev says that the Russians now control around 20 communities in Kharkov region, and he's also said in an interview for Russia 24 uh, television that the Russians will eventually um, regain control of all the territories, all the towns they lost over the course of Ukraine's counteroffensive of September. So, um, to quote Tass, to quote the report, he's been from TASS about this interview that Mr. Ganshev has given. We know that about 20 communities are already under the control of our armed forces. In addition, there are some communities in the grey zone. The grey zone is, if you like, no man's land, territory that neither Russia nor Ukraine securely, securely control. And then the TASS goes on to say that Ganshev stated that the rest of the communities that had been under the control of Russian forces earlier would be systematically liberated. Fierce hostilities are in progress on the engagement line. The Ukrainian army is constantly bringing in reserves. And, um, and, and uh, TASS draws the contrast with an earlier report from Ganshev dated the 31st of January in which Ganshev had told uh, TASS that the situation in Kharkov region for the Russians was difficult. So that was on the 31st of January. That was a time when the Russians still had the, uh, were still on the back foot in this area. Now they've regained the initiative. They're in fact pushing forward. So that's the situation, at least, that we're getting. That's the one report we've had from TASS about the situation in the Svatovo Kremenaya Kupiansk area. There is one further report which comes from TASS again, and it talks about the situation around Liman. And it reports that the Ukrainian military is erecting new fortifications and building multi layered defense lines in the Krasny Liman area. Krasny Liman, as I said, the Russian name for Liman. Uh, and the information for that has come from our old friend Andrei Marochko, 
uh, the retired lieutenant colonel of the Lugansk militia, and Tass quotes him saying, in the Krasny Liman area, the enemy is erecting new fortifications and building multi-layered defence lines. Not only servicemen and military equipment, but also civilian municipal enterprises from the city of Kharkov are being involved in the engineering work. The Ukrainian military is also using agricultural machinery of private farms in the engineering work. So that sort of tends to support earlier claims, claims that I reported yesterday, that the Russians are now pushing very close to Liman and that they're now actually threatening to recapture Liman and that and if we go back to um, what was said earlier by Mr. Ganshev, it looks as if the Russians are indeed incrementally pushing towards uh, Kupiansk. And Mr. Ganshev says that the Russians have or intend at some point to retake all the territory that they lost during Ukraine's counteroffensive back in September, and that would include places like Kupiansk, obviously, but also Izium, which is located west of the Oskol River, and Balaklia, where Ukraine's counteroffensive back in September began. So that seems to be the Russian plan. Now, that's Mr. Ganshev. He is a civilian official. I can't be certain how well informed or well briefed he is by the Russian military about what the Russian military are planning to do. But anyway, that's the information that he's providing. And by the way, another Russian official, Vladimir Rogov, who is the um, head of the, well, one of the officials rather, he's not the head, one of the officials of the Russian appointed administration in Zaporozhye region. He says that Ukraine has relocated another 5,000 troops to that area, bringing the total number of their forces in that part of the battlefronts to 25,000 men. That's what Vladimir Rogov has been saying. So anyway, that's all the information that I've seen from the battlefronts. There's lots of other speculations and rumours and discussions, but for the moment, that's all the information that I think I can give. I suspect that, as I said, over the next couple of hours or days, we're going to get an awful lot more. There's going to be a flood of information. Again, most of it, I suspect, focused on the events in Bakhmut itself, and we'll be hearing more there. I noticed that uh, um, Kirby, the Pentagon spokesman, um, conceded yesterday that uh, the Russians have indeed been making significant advances in the Bakhmut area, or rather he said small advances in the Bakhmut area, but when he talks in that way you, you can translate small to mean significant. He also, by the way, reiterated that the fall of Bakhmut would not change the strategic, the general strategic picture. Well, lots of people who disagree with that, I'm not going to rehash that discussion. But anyway, I suspect that, again, the major fighting continues to be in Bakhmut. We'll be seeing more, more information about what's going on there shortly. Anyway, perhaps a more interesting series of developments is what has been happening elsewhere, what's been going on at a meeting of high-level defence chiefs. NATO defence chiefs that has just taken place in Brussels. And this is, of course, the meeting at which, or in advance of which, Jens Stoltenberg gave that remarkable speech in which he admitted that the West is unable to keep up with Ukraine's ammunition demands. And there has been a fascinating article about this whole topic by Dr. Jack Watling, who is a um, 
a fish, a senior research fellow for land warfare at Britain's Royal United Services Institute. And he explains the nature of the problem, the nature of the crisis that uh, the West is facing, the ammunition crisis the West is facing, better than I've seen it explained by anyone else. Now, this article is behind a paywall. So, again, I'm not going to read it out in full, but I am going to quote from it extensively. And um, to begin, the title is Vladimir Putin is about to win the ammunition war against the West. And the subtitle is NATO has little time to ramp up production before Moscow resolves the remaining inertia of its manufacturing base. The talk about inertia of the Russian manufacturing base is a red herring. Um, it's something I will touch on myself. <laughs> it is the one part of this article that I disagree with, and I'm not going to cover it. I'm just going to say a few things about it after I've read, read certain ac extracts of the article itself. Anyway, uh, Watling begins by saying, Dr. Watling begins by saying, the current rate of Ukraine's ammunition expenditure is many times higher than our current rate of production, Jens Stoltenberg, NATO Secretary General, said this week. This puts our defence industries under strain. Notice that Stoltenberg talks about many times higher than our current rate of production. And I discussed in my video yesterday how Stoltenberg, in response to this reality, came up with some bizarre ideas that, like, you know, um, working extra shifts, <laughs> which don't come anywhere close to addressing the problem. And um, Dr. Watling goes on to say, in response or after quoting what Jens Stoltenberg has to say, in two sentences, Stoltenberg confirmed the major hitch in the West's effort to support Ukraine, Ukraine Kiev, one that experts have been highlighting since the first months of the war. We are running out of supplies. Now, that's Dr. Watling. He's saying that in the Daily Telegraph, as I pointed out in my programme yesterday. If you've been listening and watching Brian Boletic's videos on the new Atlas, if you've been following what Douglas McGregor, Scott Ritter, yours truly have been saying, well, that isn't going to come as any sort of news for you. But it is unusual to read this sort of thing in the Daily Telegraph. And, well, there it is now. And Dr. Watling goes on to explain that Ukraine is not using excessive amounts of artillery shells compared with historical conflicts. These shortages are instead a stark demonstration of the hollowing out of NATO since the end of the Cold War. Lifting munitions production cannot be done with an on-off switch. It will require several issues to be resolved concurrently. And then he explains that there are five processes involved in manufacturing shells, forging shell cases, produce, production of explosive energetics, charge manufacturer, manufacture, fuse manufacture, and filling. And then he says that the first process, forging cases, is simple and can be expanded through the repurposing of civilian forging capacity. But making the payload to go in them is far less easily easy. Firstly, there is the need to secure the relevant raw materials, which are in high demand on the international market and therefore expensive. Secondly, as the product is a high explosive, the factory must meet certain regulatory criteria. 
Thirdly, the product must have very high quality control and conform to specified requirements. The propellant charges, for example, must release energy at a rate that conforms to the tolerances of the system through which it will be fired and match the power upon which the range tables for the system are based. If the UK were producing 155 millimeter rounds for its own artillery, this would be one problem. But Ukraine, Ukrainian forces use 17 artillery types of both NATO and Soviet legacy design, not all of which have the technical we have the technical specifications for. Moreover, Filling and cooling shells is a precise process. The high explosive must be heated, poured into the shell casing and then cooled at a specified rate so that it does not contain deformities, cavities or cracks. The facility for doing this must be protected from climatic variations. This again brings significant regulatory constraints. And then he goes on to say, we ha then we have the less than favourable economics of the enterprise. Shells are used in vast quantities during wartime, wartime and must be cheap. This means the manufacturer makes a small margin of return on each shell. Therefore, in peacetime, the incentive to produce is vastly reduced since the state requires a small number of shells. Yes, stockpiling is an option, but shells have a shelf life of around 20 years, so it can also be wasteful. Some might say the answer is to have excess capacity, but this requires companies to keep factory facilities idle for decades, which comes with considerable overheads. Western producers cannot justify absorbing such a cost while facing cuts and being driven to compete for international contracts. Thus, munitions factories have been shrunk or closed. And it's the last, which is the root source of the entire problem. So, producing shells, well, people have been doing it for, you know, over 100 years. Um, but, so, you know, we're not talking about you know, difficult new technology, at least in theory. But there are complex and tricky aspects to this process. And I'm not going to repeat all that Dr. Watling says about the industrial process, but you can see that it's not a completely straightforward one. It doesn't, it does require a high degree of attention, a high degree of skill, correct machine tools, a proper regula regulatory environment, a well-organized and extensive production line. But the key point that Dr. Watling makes is that the West has scaled down its capacity to produce shells, especially since the Cold War, since shell production has not had a priority and is not profitable for the arms manufacturers. Um, there is little return on producing shells in industrial quantities, far more money to be made from making you know, expensive missiles and even more expensive aircraft and all sorts of complex and intricate electronic devices and no doubt things like high mass rockets and that kind of thing and precision guided munitions and all that sort of thing. So there's little money to be made in this business and it just doesn't make sense in the kind of just in time industrial environment that we have in the West to keep huge factories such as you need to produce shells in industrial quantities of the sort that you need in war. There just hasn't been the incentive to keep those factories, that, that kind of enormous spare capacity around.
And in fact, given the sort of just-in-time philosophies that the West has in terms of industrial manufacturing, it in fact makes no financial sense at all. It's loss-making, and therefore the weapons producers simply don't do it. And I don't think there's any real answer to that. You would have to completely change the entire way in which the West conducts industrial processes in order to build enormous factories, equip those factories with machine tools and you know all the forges and all that all those sort of things. Not just leave them idle, because obviously, you know, you can keep factories mothballed and idle, but if you're going to keep them mothballed, you have to periodically check that the machine tools and the forges and all of those things are in good and usable condition. And of course, you have to have a trained workforce, which you can redeploy from various industrial activities and you have to have that trained workforce all the time probably doing fewer things than is acceptable in a western industrial environment so that you can redeploy this workforce to those factories when you need it and get that production of shells going now in the West, we don't do that. We don't do that because our entire industrial financial system simply doesn't make it possible. You're simply not going to have, cannot have a situation where um, industrial producers are prepared to leave vast amounts of factories lying idle. And when... We do produce artillery in the West, which of course we do. We approach artillery in a completely different way. We go in for very sophisticated artillery. We like the M777 howitzers, with their very high pressures, their um, use of expensive alloys, you know, some of them using titanium as a expensive subcomponent, their lightness, that all of this intended, you know, perhaps to achieve very long ranges and to be able to maneuver these guns, you know, with great speed. The French Caesar howitzers are, you know, the same sort of things. They're expensive toolkits. They're, they're, they're not just guns, they're expensive guns. And, of course, the very high pressures they use will, of course, dictate the kind of shells they can fire as well. So you do this partly because, of course, your way of war starts to be structured around the fact that you're only going to have limited amounts of ammunition, but also because that's profitable. That is what makes commercial sense to the arms manufacturers. I know that arms manufacturers get criticised a lot, in so many ways, deservedly so. But the nature of our economic industrial system in the West almost inevitably is going to push arms manufacturers in that type of direction towards making these kind of weapons, these kind of sophisticated, complex weapons that are profitable for the manufacturers, because if it's not profitable, if they lose making it bluntly, they're not going to make it, and an army needs guns. So that, of course, also dictates a lot about the Western way of war, because, of course, if we are going to have small numbers of guns and small numbers of shells, and these are going to be expensive guns and expensive shells and very, very high tool kit, well, inevitably, our fighting skills, the way our armies are trained, the way they operate on the battlefields, will be influenced by those criteria as well.
And there's been a great deal said, and by, you know, lots of military people, by Lieutenant Colonel Daniel Davis, by Colonel Douglas McGregor, by Scott Ritter, especially, I should say, Scott Ritter, but, you know, all the other three, too, about the way in which NATO, the West, the United States, has reorganized its military and diluted its military to fight these local wars, these, high, these, these local wars in places like Iraq, Afghanistan, um, those kind of places, and how we've ended up getting the kind of equipment that is really geared to fighting wars in those sort of places, and that Western um, infantry and aircraft and all, all those parts of the war machine have now been degraded from conventional war, you know, the kind of war we're seeing in Ukraine, in order to fight these sort of wars. But I think a point that's perhaps worth adding is that, yes, there's been a major political incentive to fight these wars. The neocons have had all their grand strategies in the Middle East, in Afghanistan, in Iraq, in all those sort of places. But of course, one reason why probably we've restructured our militaries in these sort of ways and engaged in these kind of wars is because they're the kind of wars that our economic and industrial systems are most effectively geared to waging. We're not really capable or really structured to fight heavy attritional industrial wars like the sort we're seeing in Ukraine. So our militaries <laughs> have reconfigured themselves to fight the kind of wars that our military industrial systems can support, which are the local wars which we've been fighting in the Middle East and elsewhere. And there is some degree of, there's a very high degree of political pull from the neocons, but there's also been a very significant degree of technological and industrial push from the military industrial complex and of course the neocons get their wars and the, ne the military industrial complex gets its profits and up to now everybody has been happy but of course Ukraine is different and perhaps it's important at this point to say that Russia is different too and the weakest part of Jack Watling, Dr Watling's article is that he seems to suggest that um, the Russian industrial system has also had to be reorganized in some dramatic way. His last paragraph leads as follows. Russia also requires vast amounts of ammunition. However, Putin has put his entire economy on a war footing. That, by the way, is entirely wrong. <laughs> it is not subject to the same commercial constraints as NATO's defence industry. That is true. We'll come to that in a moment. And Russia, Russian producers are not constrained by concerns over industrial safety. That is flat out wrong as well. And... Um, then he ends by saying that NATO must strive to ramp up production before Moscow resolves the inefficiencies, corruption and inertia of its manufacturing base. The Russian manufacturing base in reality is completely different. Uh, first of all, Russian factories, the Russian military industrial complex, not all Russian factories, but those parts that are critical to the military industrial complex remain state owned. So he's quite correct that the Russians don't suffer from the same kind of commercial constraints as NATO's defense industry does. It's not so important for Russian, for Russian arms manufacturers to make profits because they're state owned, 
and ultimately they do want to sell their weapons around the world and they do so successfully by the way and they do get into tough negotiations with the Russian authorities about um, the cost of particular weapon systems that they produce. There's been big arguments in Russia about the, the correct cost of Suhoi 57 fighter jets and those sort of things. So it's not correct to say that Russia is able to produce weapons regardless of costs. But unlike in the West, because Russian manufacturers are insulated, they can keep vast factories lying idle with their machine tools and their forges and all of the rest until they're needed, making it possible to ramp up production at short notice. And again, I'm going to say this, I have seen this, I have seen Russian factories that are like that. And it's not difficult if you go back in Russian history to understand how that happened. Because, of course, the Russians have fought many land wars and there have been instances when, in the past, they have found themselves short of ammunition themselves. A very famous instance, one that burnt itself in the memory, the institutional memory, both of the Russian military and of the Russian military-industrial complex arose at the start of the First World War. The um, Russian general staff of that time, of course it was the Tsar's general staff, made calculations about um, artillery expenditure, shells that would be needed in battle, and those calculations made before the war proved by orders of magnitude too low. So at the beginning of the First World War, the Russians found themselves very short of guns and very short of artillery. And this was one of the primary reasons why the Russian armies in the first year and a half of the First World War found themselves constantly on the back foot in their fighting against the Germans on the Eastern Front, why they lost considerable ground and suffered heavy losses, all of which, by the way, had an accumulative effect, so that even though these ammunition shortages were finally resolved by 1916, the political impact of the defeats and retreats of the first 18 months of the war caused the political crisis, which eventually were well, one of the factors rather than which led to the political crisis, which caused the fall of the Tsar and the Russian Revolution that subsequently ensued. So ever since then, the Russians have been determined never to get themselves in the same position again. And um, they've always prioritized not just production of ammunition and the setting up of enormous stocks, stockpiles of ammunition, which they're able to bring out of use when needed, but they have retained the production capacity to produce ammunition at short notice and to ramp up production as needed. And they've done it in ways that no one in the West has been able to do and as I've said previously, their military industrial complex is greatly geared to making that kind of thing possible. And it's not just true, of course, of shells. It's true of other things. It's true of tanks. It's true of gas turbines and jet engines. The factory I'm familiar with is one that was basically created to produce engines for aircraft. These factories can be reactivated, they're, they're enormous, and they can be reactivated and expanded, they can, use, they can expand production very rapidly. And again, the Russian educational system, 
is such that there is large amounts of trained manpower available in order to make, in order to, which can be enlisted into these factories and which can work to get this manufacturing going again and going at speed. And that is why Russia is able to produce weapons so fast and in such quantities. Uh, the Germans were astonished by this when it happened during the Second World War. They were astonished also at uh, the way in which the Russians were able to relocate factories from areas to the, in the west of their country, transfer them with... Uh, significant parts of their trained workforce, the engineers, the technicians, all the way to the Urals and restart production there and have that happen within a few weeks or months of the war starting. And again, this was an extraordinary industrial and organizational achievement, but it was done because it was it was made possible because, again, the Russian industrial system, the Soviet industrial system, had already planned and prepared for exactly those sort of event eventualities before the war began. No Western industrial system is organized in that way. As I said, it would make no sense, given our financial constraints, the, the, the way in which our industrial systems operate for that to happen. So, that's from Dr. Watling, and it illustrates the problem. And can I just say, this problem is going to get worse. Ukraine is using up between five and 6,000 rounds of ammunition a day. Russia averages around 20,000 rounds a day. Sometimes it can go a lot higher. Sometimes it can touch 60,000 a day. It has done at various points in the war. So that's already a big discrepancy. But it's going to get bigger still. Because even as NATO chiefs talk about increasing production of shells, the Russians are already almost certainly doing it. In fact, they're talking about the fact that they're doing it. So you know, if the West, say, manages to increase shell production fivefold in two years, as the US is saying it might do, I mean, that's apparently the plan. Well, by that point, the Russians will have increased their shell production as well by orders of magnitude, and they will have done so over a significant period. They would have been doing this over many months before Western production hits those levels. And, of course, the gap will actually have grown. And, well... This is going to be a problem in many other areas. Anyway, it wasn't just production of shells that um, NATO officials were talking about in Brussels. It's now clear that Ukraine is not going to get any artillery any time soon. And again, I take this from the Daily Telegraph. Ukraine's NATO allies did not reach a decision over fighter jets at a high-level defence meeting in Brussels. I don't have any announcements on aircraft to make today, US Defence Secretary Lloyd Austin said at the NATO headquarters in the city. Now, can I just say that talking about Lloyd Austin, in my programme yesterday, I spoke about the fact that there are... Um, different factions in the Pentagon. One, which is counselling restraint and retrenchment, telling Ukraine not to launch offensives prematurely and to conserve its manpower and to pull back from places like Bakhmut and to try to learn to operate its new 
equipment, its new infantry fighting vehicles, its Bradleys and its Marders and those sort of things, which are now arriving from the west. There's pictures, by the way, of some of these Bradleys now appearing at a German port, Bremenhaven, and no doubt they'll be moving eastward fairly soon uh, to training bases in Poland. Anyway, um, that's one side of the Pentagon cancelling one thing, but there is another faction in the Pentagon which, on the contrary, is urging Ukraine to escalate. It's telling Ukraine become more dynamic, more active, engage in offensives now because we're up against the clock. By midsummer, willingness in Congress to go on supplying um, funds for more weapons production might start to evaporate. So if you're going to achieve any kind of victories, any sort of breakthroughs, you need to do it now. Now, I suggested in my program yesterday that the uniformed military, the Joint Chiefs of Staff and people like that, are probably the people who are advising restraint and those who are pushing Ukraine to adopt a more aggressive strategy are most probably civilians. In other words, political appointments. I just want to say, in passing, that though Lloyd Austin has a military background, in my opinion, he falls in the latter, in the latter category. He's clearly a, politically, a political appointment. His background, he's had a recent background in the military-industrial complex, but my own feeling is that he's a loyal executor of the administration's policies. And despite his former military background, I think he's one of those who's urging Ukraine to take a more activist line, who's pushing Ukraine towards premature offensives. And might be of interest to see what the Russians are saying about that. Now, I'm taking this from a Russian newspaper called Redovka. I believe it's published in Smolensk. It's not Moscow-based, um, and it takes a very strongly um, pro-war position in Russia. Um, so, I mean, you know, bear all that in mind. It's very much on the, shall we say, the... Uh, patriotic, nationalist uh, side of Russian politics. But it is it does cover the war very thoroughly, and it has several reporters on the battlefronts. And it's, again, I found it on balance a you know, reasonably reliable place to pick up Russian accounts of what's going on on the battlefronts. And incidentally, it is often very critical of the Russian general staff, of Russian commanders, and doesn't spare sometimes in its criticisms. But this is a Russian view of what might happen if Ukraine were to launch an offensive now. And this is a translation of an article published in Russian for a Russian readership. So I don't think you can say that this is intended to um, try to influence Western opinion. Of course, it might be picked up in Ukraine. Many people in Ukraine, most people in Ukraine speak Russian, but I doubt that they would have access to it. So I think this is, this article reflects, if you like, an internal Russian discussion in the Russian media about what might happen if Ukraine were to try to launch some kind of offensive over the next few weeks. And it says that the following, the spring offensive of the armed forces of Ukraine will be unprepared and bloody. And it goes on to say, um, it is impossible to complete a long course of study, of training in a couple of months, 
Western politicians are in unison pushing the Ukrainian army to attack. Um, in addition, there are concerns about a possible turning point and Ukrainian authorities themselves are in a uh, uh, are, are also you know talking about this this sort of thing and in the meantime the western powers are in a hurry to pump up ukraine with equipment and weapons to the maximum degree and bradley fighting vehicles um are already soon going to arrive in poland and from there they will go on to ukraine and the first deliveries of tanks are promised however although the training of the ukrainian military in the use of this new equipment has already begun it is impossible to complete a long course in a couple of months so why does the west send troops that are not completely prepared into battle. Where is the hurry? After all, even in the West, they admit that despite the massive deliveries of armoured vehicles, I'm not sure that these deliveries are in fact massive, but anyway, there is no question of any strategic su success in this spring offensive by Ukraine. Ukraine does not have enough shells, new units are not properly trained, and the advantage of the Russian aerospace forces in the air will neg negate any local successes achieved by the Ukrainian troops. Why do all of this? And it then says, probably the Ukrainian issue has now become the subject of domestic political bargaining, in the United States, the administration needs to prove that the course of ex escalation and maximum support for Ukraine was the right one. And then the article starts to speculate about Ukraine, uh, US politics, which I'm not sure it's best equipped to do. It talks a lot about the debt ceiling issues, um, which I'm not going to discuss extensively in, these pro in this programme. I think this looks more impressive, this debt ceiling argument looks more impressive to outsiders than it is in reality. I think that there's a much more straightforward reason for this, which is that the administration, people like Lloyd Austin, sense that the problem is not going to be money there's always money in the United States for pretty much everything. The problem is supply. I've talked about shells. You can't just say I'm going to spend $100 billion and that's going to produce lots and lots of shells. Uh, to go back to what Dr. Watling uh, um, said, uh, you can't just switch production on and off it doesn't work like that you've got to train the manpower you've got to build the factories you've got to make the machine tools you've got to establish the regulatory environment and of course it isn't just shells shells in some ways are almost the simplest thing it's got to be done the same ha has to happen with missiles with all of the other weapons that the west has been um, supplying ukraine and I think there is a gradual understanding or growing understanding and growing alarm in the West that unless this war can be turned around in some form before midsummer, that the logistical constraints are going to become unbearable, that it simply will not be possible to continue to supply Ukraine with shells and rockets and missiles and all of those things beyond the summer, because at that point, arsenals will have been de depleted to critical levels. And I discussed how a few weeks ago, senior officials of the US Navy 
the people who I suspect are the most skeptical about this war. They're principally focused, after all, on fighting China. They've said that they, they gave a time frame of around six months. They said beyond six months, the United States will have to make certain very difficult choices. Does it go, go on supplying Ukraine or trying to supply Ukraine? At which point its own military abilities will be significantly degraded? Or does it instead draw back and prioritize its own military needs? So I think this is, in fact, probably the problem. Not, as I said, money. As I said, you can always find money in the United States. Um, it's an unhappy fact. It's probably one that's going to lead to many problems in the long term, or perhaps not the long, such long term. But anyway, I don't think we're going to see a financial crisis prevent more dollars being found to support Ukraine by midsummer. There might be growing opposition in Congress. Republicans are clearly becoming increasingly unhappy. But the real problem is that supplies are going to become excessively stretched. And I think that's really what the issue is. There's unwillingness to part with tanks. We've seen that already. Unwillingness to part with fighter jets. The US has now told Ukraine it doesn't have enough Atakams missiles to supply to Ukraine. I suspect the, as I think it's called the Storm Shadow cruise missile that the British have been talking about, which anyway needs to be launched from uh, aircraft and We've seen the problems with aircraft. Um, there's um, concerns about those. This is the problem. It's that the West is going to find it very, very difficult indeed to sustain these supplies for very much longer. And Brian Balletic recently did a good piece about the latest US arms package for Ukraine. This was some weeks ago now, but he pointed out that when it came to supplies of ammunition, supplies of high Mars missiles, those sort of things, the figures are either, either vanishing or becoming increasingly vague. And that when the US does talk about providing other types of weapons, like these glided bombs that are going to be launched from these high Mars rockets, well, they're not even been produced yet, or at least not in any particular quantities. So this is, I think, the constraining factor. And it's what is pushing people, the neocons, the people like Lloyd Austin in the Pentagon, to tell Ukraine, you've got to turn this thing round now. You've only got a very limited time window left. If you fail to do it, then by midsummer, the situation is going to become absolutely critical for you. Now, I can't help but think that the Russians understand this very well. And I think that it's always difficult to reconstruct what Russian plans are. But I do wonder whether the Russians aren't, to some extent, as I said, planning for the possibility of a Ukrainian offensive over the next few weeks and that their major blow will come in afterwards. Who knows? I am going to say one thing, and this is one point where I'm going to push back a little against Brian Boletic. Um, he has suggested that these huge Russian forces that have been gathered around the battlefronts, um, that, they're, that they've been positioned um, with the intention of waiting until the moment of Ukraine's eventual collapse and that um, the Russians might, be, might not be intending, or at least this is how I understand it, that it's possible that the Russians might not be intending to use these 
forces in an offensive capacity until then. Well, that might be correct, but I have to say this. I find it very, very difficult to believe, personally, that the Russians would assemble forces of hundreds of thousands of men, keep them on the, you know, behind the lines in presumably tents and things of that kind, <laughs> and leave these soldiers idle with all the problems that that causes for soldiers. I, I understand that the caliber of soldiers starts to deteriorate, deteriorate before beyond a certain point if they're kept idle behind the front lines. I would have thought that once the training processes and um, uh, you know, assimilation processes, the reorganization, the re-equipment, once all of that is done, I would have thought that the Russians would want to use these forces in some way. It might not be big arrow offensives. It might be pushing hard against Ukrainian defence lines, forcing U the Ukrainians to use up more of their reserves, burning through more of their equipment, that kind of thing. But I can't seriously imagine that the Russians are going to allow hundreds of thousands of troops to, sit, to simply sit around and remain idle until Ukraine itself collapses. I don't think this is the sort of thing that the Russians do. So there you are, one instance where Brian Baletic and I don't fully agree. But anyway, there we go. So um, we'll see anyway what the Russians actually do. But other things have been happening too, because NATO... They're not going to provide fighter jets anytime soon. They're discussed in many programs, the enormous problems about that. No talk, by the way, either of supplying long-range drones. has been discussed as well. <coughs> but there's been reports that NATO officials are becoming increasingly concerned that if these kind of advanced weapons are sent to Ukraine... The Russians might capture them, might be able to take them apart, might be able to share the technology uh, with the Chinese. And, you know, so for that reason, these long range drones are not going to be provided either, at least not for the time being. Um, none of that. But again, talk about air defense missiles. And Italy, a short time ago, did provide some air defense missiles. Um, our speed, these are, there are not many of them, by the way, but to the extent that Italy and France have some of these, they're providing a battery. Um, the United States eventually is going to provide a Patriot battery. We haven't seen it. It's not even on the horizon yet. Talk it might not appear before 2024. Germany and the Netherlands are apparently planning to do the same thing. But in the meantime, Russia continues to launch its missile attacks against Ukraine. It continues to degrade not just the Ukrainian energy system. It's becoming increasingly clear that part of the purpose is also to degrade Ukraine's air defense system. And over the course of that meeting in Brussels, there was an admission that Russia has kept its air force intact, Russian air force is intact, and there's now growing alarm that the Russians are building up their air forces around Ukraine. And I'm taking this again from uh, the Daily Telegraph. Russia is preparing a new air assault with fighter jets and attack helicopters, Western intelligence has warned. And intelligence shared amongst the alliance's member states uh, um, shows a build-up of fixed-wing and rotary aircraft on Russia's borders with Ukraine, according to two people briefed on the discussions. And, you know, we could be um, looking at large numbers of aircraft, and it, the Daily Telegraph can't resist saying, it is believed, believed by whom, Moscow could attempt to use the air assets to gain the initiative in the eastern Donbass region because the artillery-led ground forces have so far failed to do so. If so, that would last paragraph was true. 
Why are we worrying, stressing about ammunition? But anyway, I'm not going to go over these strange little comments that get inserted in these articles, trying to spin a disastrous picture, make it look less bad than it really is. Um, the point is, talk about a big aerial build-up by the Russians. Well, who knows? <laughs> I've discussed in previous programmes how if the air defence system across Ukraine is indeed degraded to the point where it can't function properly anymore, and we might be getting ever closer to that. Back in January, there were reports that Ukraine is running out of S-300 missiles. Quite probably true. And the Western systems that are replacing it, not looking particularly effective. More and more drones now, Geranium-2 drones, launching attacks on Ukraine. And we've seen Russia's no shortage of cruise missiles. The last cruise missile attack, by the way, the numbers, Ukraine has cranked up the numbers, have said it wasn't 71 missiles that Russia launched, it was around 100. So no sign of the Russians running out of cruise missiles. Well, it could be that Ukraine's stocks of air defence missiles are running down very fast, and it could be that the Russians are indeed planning an aerial campaign. And I've discussed in previous programmes how dropping bombs on fortifications, the kind of fortifications that Ukraine has created, is more effective in destroying those fortifications than shelling fortifications. It's because of the greater power of these bombs and of the way in which fortifications are built. So, well, we'll see. So it could be that all of that is happening, but then, of course, it could also be that the reason all this air power is being deployed is because the Russians are waiting for Ukraine's spring offensive and are going to unleash it on the infantry fighting vehicles and tanks which the Ukrainians are going to try to launch on whatever part of the Russian lines Ukraine is planning to attack. So we'll just have to see. Anyway... That's essentially all I'm going to say about Ukraine today. Um, more admissions, as we see from the West, that even as the Russian build-up continues on this massive scale, and one wonders how much, how many men and machines there actually are there, but it's clearly in the hundreds of thousands. Clearly, Ukraine coming under very heavy pressure all along the battlefronts, um, the West struggling to come up with solutions for Ukraine's needs, perhaps, or indeed increasingly starting to recognise that it might not be able to come up with these solutions, but still unwilling to do what needs to be done and enter into negotiations. Now, I'm going to just touch on two further topics. Firstly, I wanted to say that we've seen a further example of how the administration is extraordinarily resistant to um, any kind of concession to Moscow, despite the fact that the situation on the Ukrainian battlefields is becoming more difficult. And we've had a very vivid illustration of the sort of knee-jerk reaction that the administration um, makes when it comes under pressure, when it looks as if the Russians might be about to do something which is going to interfere with the administration's policies. So, the Russians said that in March they might consider um, reducing production, oil production, by half a million barrels a day. And this is happening, by the way, at the same time as other OPEC producers, including Saudi Arabia, have also been quietly shaving 
their production as well, though obviously by not such an amount. So within hours of that information coming out of Moscow, the, we got reports that the United States, the administration, is now, has now decided to release another 26 million barrels of oil from the United States' strategic oil reserve. This has been depleted to its lowest level since the early 1980s. But all it, need, all it needed was an announcement from Moscow that um, it's going to cut back production by half a million barrels a day for the administration to release, or now to decide apparently to release another 26 million barrels of oil. Now, over nine months, very rough calculation, the Russian production cut will come to, I guess, around 140 million barrels. So what's 26 million barrels going to do to set off that? Well, it will make a difference on the margins. And, of course, a lot will depend on what the rest of OPEC does. But the point was that just a short time ago, there was talk that the United States was not going to draw down its reserves further, its oil reserve any further. It was going to build it up. Well, as I said, a relatively small production cut by the Russians has been enough, apparently, to get the administration to reverse that policy, depleting its strategic reserve even further. And I have to say that is an extraordinary state of affairs because the strategic reserve was intended for a period of crisis, like the, you know, the oil embargo that the Arab states imposed during the 1973 Arab-Israeli war. We're not in anything like that kind of situation at the moment. All the problems with oil production and oil supply have been the result of the administration's own policies and that those of the, its European allies. It's they who've acted to interfere and disrupt the world energy market. But anyway, such is the fixation <laughs> with trying to keep the pressure on the Russians that the administration is apparently willing to continue to supply the world oil market with oil out of the U.S.'s strategic reserves simply in response to a Russian production cut. And the other thing has been, what I get to start to suggest, perhaps ought to be properly called balloon gate. I mean, this very strange affair, which is becoming even more bizarre. Now, I talked about how difficult it's proving for the United States, for the Western powers, to find air defense systems for Ukraine. Ukraine is facing this massive missile offensive um, that's been launched against it, cruise missiles, geranium true drones, ballistic missiles. Every so often they come striking Ukrainian targets. It's important to say that every single day Ukraine is coming under an attack of some kind of this nature. We focus on the one or two or three or four days in a month when the Russians launch a big strike. But every so well, every day, the Russians launch more smaller strikes hitting particular Ukrainian targets. This is going on all the time. And the West is now talking about deploying air defense systems to protect Ukraine from this kind of thing. And at the same time, the United States is finding it is struggling, has been rushing around, shooting down balloons. <laughs> and the balloons that it's shooting down, we now learn it didn't really identify some of these balloons properly, wasn't quite sure what it was shooting down. And it's plausible that 
Some of these balloons that it has been shooting down are its own weather balloons. Now, I don't want to push analogies too far. I've suggested that perhaps balloons are not quite the easy targets that some people think, but it doesn't make an impressive picture. And it does make one wonder if the United States has been so chaotic in terms of its protection of its own airspace or pretended protection of its own airspace, as this balloon debacle might suggest, whether it's really in a position to provide the kind of air defense system that Ukraine needs. Now, I say that, you know, I might get some pushback and perhaps people will correctly say that there's a huge difference between the two and I'm not comparing like with like. But overall, I have to say that the Russians observing all of this, I can't help but think that they're going to be very unimpressed by what the Americans have achieved shooting down these balloons. And certainly it doesn't seem to compare with the sophistication and complexity and multi-layered nature of Russia's own air defense system. So anyway, there we are. That's me for the day. I fully predict that by tomorrow, we'll be getting a lot more information from the battlefronts. And when that happens, obviously, I will both discuss it and comment upon it. That's me anyway for the day. Um, I look forward to see have you know to, to to the next video doing the next video on this channel. In the meantime, let me remind you: all our videos can be found on our various platforms: Locals, Rumble, Bitshoot, Odyssey, Rockfin, and Telegram. You can also um, support our work if you wish via Patreon and Subscribe Star links under this video. Don't forget to check out our shop. Go to all the great things that you will see there. Our magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our t-shirts, our sweatshirts, all of those things. And last but not least, please uh, remember, if you've liked this video, to tick the like button and to check your subscription to this channel. Thank you again and more from me soon and have a very good day.